forgiveness of sins. When we die, is it the end? We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Thank you very much. Boy, it's good to be here this morning. I've been blessed. Have you, anybody else been blessed this morning? <laughs> it's a joy to be together. You know what this reminds me of? So I have been. We were praying for East Africa today. Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, uh, Congo, and so on. I've been there. And it, this reminds me of being in a place where we sing and we worship and we dance for probably an hour or two. And then finally, we, we get to the preaching. But you know what? There's already been a ton of preaching. <laughs> Isn't it true? It, it, we've been preaching. We've been exalting the Lord. We've been lifting up his name and telling his truth in song and in worship and in dance and in movement around here and in testimony. So it is wonderful. We praise the Lord this morning. So I want to pray for a second again, and then let's look into the word. Our Father, great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amazing Trinity, three in one, perfect fellowship together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you invite us into perfect fellowship with you. What an honor. You are amazing, Lord. You invite us into your family as your kids your daughters and your sons and you call us beloved so lord we understand this day also that our faith is tested often we go through hard times and we wonder we wonder even like the psalmist says why have you forgotten about me, oh God? Well, we do. Just say it, Lord, right out. And, uh, and yet we know that you're faithful. And we've declared this today. And you are with us. Your name is Emmanuel, the God who is with us. So we are never alone because you're with us. And we praise you and thank you for this. So as we look into your word just now, Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to hear you. And as Kenny's already prayed, may we be fertile soil for this seed to fall in and bear abundant fruit, eternal fruit. For your honor and glory, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first passage that we read today was from Lamentations. Goodness, lamentations, that's a lament. That's when we cry out because things aren't going well. And uh, that first passage uh, from Lamentations, uh, this is Jeremiah who's called the weeping prophet. Do you know that? And Jeremiah was a prophet in Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem fell, he was taken out. He was saved and he was brought down in the valley and up the other side on the Mount of Olives. And he was looking out over Jerusalem as Jerusalem was being sacked as the temple of Almighty God. The Most High God is going up in flames. Can you believe it? 
And he's sitting over here and he's lamenting as he sees people getting slaughtered and the city of God being destroyed. Ugh, how is this possible? And he writes this. Uh, this is what we read this morning. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. Ugh, it's very low. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. And it doesn't sound very victorious, does it? But we keep going. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love. The Hebrew word is chesed. It's the loyal love. It's the love that never fails. It's the undeserved love of God toward us. He says this, because of the Lord's great chesed love, loyal love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. How often do they fail? Never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, ah, oh, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I'll wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Those are words of incredible faith and incredible victory in the midst of testing, would you say? Great, great testing. And we, when we go to the Mark passage and we look at this today, we see also people who were incredibly tested and um, in, in awful situations. And yet, they exercised faith in the midst of their testing. In the midst of the most difficult times, they come to Jesus. And faith is coming to Jesus. Really interesting to me that faith... Is uh, it can be mocked in the world a little bit, right? Faith. Somebody says to you, oh, I wish I had your faith, which sort of means I wish I could be simple-minded like you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, you never know what's really in their heart. Eh? But faith, when, when we come to God talking about faith, he lifts faith up as this high and lofty and powerful practice that we have in our lives when, when we don't see things, just like we were saying a minute ago, when I don't see him working, he's still faithful and he's still there and we continue to, to trust in him. So it's interesting to me that faith is always mixed with doubt. Did you notice that? Faith is always mixed with doubt. One of the fascinating passages to me is in Matthew chapter 28, when you come to the commissioning of the disciples. At the, right at the end of Matthew, it said that um, the disciples came and they saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, right? They saw Jesus and they worshipped him and some doubted. I look at that and say, what? <laughs> this is the resurrected Jesus right here. How can you doubt he's right here? And yet they did. And those are the very people that Jesus sends out to change the world. He says, go Preach the gospel to all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them everything I've commanded you. And you know what? I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So if you have doubts, if you have struggles, that doesn't disqualify any of us. We just keep coming back to Jesus, and he helps us deal with those things. So when we come to Mark, we see that these, we see faith, um, always is born in a time of need, great need. And we see with it, that faith always comes to Jesus to meet that need. So it's not faith in faith. You know, sort of seems like that, you know, you say, well, have faith. Have faith. The Edmonton Oilers are going to win. You know, have faith. Well, how did that go? <laughs> not very well. But faith in faith, just sort of like if we believe it hard enough, it's going to happen. No. This is faith in a person. It's faith in Jesus. And Jesus comes through for us. 
So this is what we see. Mark 5 is divided into three sections here. The first one is Jairus coming to Jesus. The second section is in a, a woman who's had an awful health problem coming to Jesus. And the third piece is Jairus and Jesus going to the daughter. So we're going to take a look at those three sections today and see what we can learn about, about faith. There's one great principle of faith in each one of these sections. So here we go. Jesus has been across the Sea of Galilee. You should read this whole passage sometime. He's been across on the other side. He cast demons out of a guy who had uh, many demons in him. And uh, that was when the sea went just wild and he calmed the sea. And so he comes back over to the west side now, to probably Capernaum, and all he's like a rock star. People have heard all about him. They've heard about the miracles. They've heard his teaching, and they've, they've seen his miracles over there on that side around Capernaum as well. So when they hear that Jesus is getting off the boat, they all run down to the beach to, to see him there. And um, this big crowd is around, and then there's a disturbance at the back of the crowd, and somebody is walking down through the crowd, and everybody sort of moves away, and they look, and it's Jairus. Jairus is like the head guy in the synagogue. He's a big man around town. He's very influential. He's really important. He's got a big reputation to guard. He comes walking up, and everybody's going, oh, baby, this should be good. <laughs> you know how the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have argued with Jesus and made all kinds of a scene and everything. I wonder what's going to happen here. And he comes walking up, and he looks at Jesus. And he falls to his knees in the sand. He gets low before Jesus. And he looks up. And Jesus looks at him. And he comes because he's got this incredible need. And he says, if you look at it here in Mark chapter 5, he, this is what he says. My little daughter is dying Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. If you read this in the Greek, it's a garbled sentence. Usually there's a structure to verbs and nouns and descriptors and so on. This sentence is garbled. Do you know why? This guy is distraught. He can hardly put a sentence together. And even if you haven't had children, I think you can understand what this is like to have a child who's near death. I mean, it breaks all of our hearts, doesn't it? And when we lived up in Labrador, Ruth and I, one of our kids had a huge fever. So we rushed to the hospital. We got there. We're waiting for the, for the help. And he starts to go into a convulsion, and his eyes roll back. And then he starts to twitch like this. And then it all stops. Good God, I mean that reverently. My heart almost stopped, and they rushed us out, and they rushed in, and they started working on him right away. It was a febrile convulsion, and he turned out to be okay, but it was scary. You with me? This is Jairus coming to Jesus and saying, oh, please come and help me. He's desperate, and his faith breaks through his position, breaks through his pride, breaks through his reputation, breaks through to come to Jesus to help him in his time of need. Because faith is this conviction in our hearts that is born out of a great need that breaks through, in this case, pride and reputation to come to Jesus. It breaks through all of those things to come to Jesus to meet, to meet our need. And that's what he loves to do. Faith. Um, pride and position can really affect our walk with the Lord as well. When we're too proud to humble ourselves, 
to ask for help, to ask for prayer. Um, we saw this this morning, asking for prayer, humbling, coming up, ask for prayer, offer praise to the Lord. In Canada, I think because of pride and because maybe lack of need in some cases, people don't feel there's any need for the Lord at all. Why should I go to church? Why do I need God? I'm fine. I'm doing okay. And sometimes my pride keeps me from asking for help. God has given you a church family here. I mean, you belong to one another. Look at you brothers and sisters around here. And the Lord has given you to one another. Jesus is in you. And when you come to one another and you share your needs like this and you pray for one another, Jesus does his ministry that way. But pride can interfere with our life of faith as well. But we keep moving with the story here, okay? Because there's another commotion in the crowd as they're going along. And Jesus stops everybody. And he looks penetratingly at the crowd. And he says, who touched my garment? And his disciples, this is hilarious to the disciples. What on earth? Hundreds of people have touched you. There's a crowd milling around. What are you doing? He says, no power has gone out from me. And this dear, precious woman steps out of the crowd. And if you notice, she also falls down before Jesus. She takes the low position before Jesus again, humbly coming before him. And her story spills out that she has had 12 years of this awful disease. We don't know exactly what it was, but it appears it was a bleeding, maybe from her uterus, and just embarrassing. But she has lost so much over this years. She has lost all her money. That's what it says right in the scripture, giving it to doctors who couldn't help her. She has lost her position in society. She has lost her... Um, social standing, because everywhere she goes, she has to clean, cl call out, unclean, unclean. And she's lost her, her position in faith because she wasn't allowed to go to the temple to worship. She has lost so much. And she risks the, um, the social forces and the religious forces that say to her, you get out of here. You don't belong here. Don't come to Jesus. She resists those things, and she comes, and she touches the garment of Jesus, and immediately, <laughs> this is incredible. It's amazing. It is true. Immediately, according to the scriptures, immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Did we sing a song about freedom? Yeah. Kenny, did we? <laughs> I think we did. And she felt this amazing freedom. Oh, it's done. How amazing is that? And Jesus turns to her. Well, I just think hundreds of people had touched Jesus. But when she touched him, she was healed because she had faith. She broke through the social forces that would keep her away and the religious forces that would keep her away. She had a need. She broke through those forces in order to come to Jesus to meet that need. And Jesus met her there. Now Jesus turns to her. And what's he going to do? It, the scripture says that she feared. Well, why would she fear Jesus? She, in effect, she wanted to steal the healing and run away just don't don't look at me don't anybody notice me i just want to get out of here okay just but jesus is never happy with that jesus wants relationship does he he wants fellowship with her he wants to talk with her he wants to be with her not just get your healing and run good night so jesus he desires this communion with her and he, listen to the term of endearment, he calls her daughter. She has been an outcast, a person thrown out on the fringes of everything. And Jesus calls her daughter and brings her right in and lifts her up and, and honors her in front of everybody, of all the people who've dishonored her. Is this Jesus? Is this what he does? This is how he is. Oh, what a savior. 
She's a brave woman who overcomes social forces and religious forces to meet Jesus. Because here's the second insight, that faith is this conviction in our hearts that's born out of a need, right? She had a great need. But that, that conviction breaks through the social and religious forces to trust Jesus to meet the need. And that's what she did. And for all of us, you know, there are social pressures on us. Are there at times? Like if I'm sold out for Jesus, what are the neighbors going to say? If I'm really like committed to the Lord, if I'm coming to Bible studies at the church here during the week, not just Sunday, right? If I'm doing stuff during the week, if I'm involved in this day camp for the kids this week and serving the Lord sacrificially like this, what are people going to think about me? If I... I'm a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. What will people say? There are social forces. If I dare to pray for somebody, what will they say? And faith is this conviction born out of a need that breaks through social and religious barriers and forces to trust Jesus Christ to meet our need. But the story continues. <clears throat> Jairus, if you were Jairus, what would you be thinking? My daughter's dying over here. Jesus has stopped. Everything stopped. We're supposed to be rushing over here. But there he is. He's, he's there. And a runner comes up. And really no words need to be said. Because we know why the runner is there. But he delivers the message anyway. And he says this. Cryptic. Abrupt. Your daughter is dead. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Do you ever feel like a bother to Jesus? You are never a bother to Jesus. His hope sinks. Dear Jairus, there's a lump in his throat. You can feel it in his gut. The sunshine of her childhood is has morphed into the valley of the shadow of death. So Jesus turns to him, looks into his watery eyes and says, don't be afraid, only keep on believing. In this translation, don't be afraid, just believe. It's a present tense. It means only keep on believing. Don't stop. And so he takes Peter and James and John, and they go to the house, and there are mourners there who are hopeless. Because when Jesus mentions a word of hope to them, they just laugh at him. So he moves them all out, and he takes them inside the room. And he takes them to this place of death. And he speaks in Aramaic, which is their mother tongue, and he says, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And I don't know where her spirit was. Her spirit had dis departed. God knows all these things. But wherever her spirit was, her spirit heard and came back into that little body. And the flush of circulating blood started to color her face again and she gets up and Jesus wants her to head for the fridge right away. This is interesting. He says, it, look, this has been hard on her too. I mean, she died. Give her some food, <laughs> right? <laughs> Jesus met Jairus at his point of greatest need in an absolutely hopeless situation. And the third insight is this, keep on believing because faith is this conviction in our hearts born out of a need, a huge need, right? Born out of need that breaks through even a hopeless, despairing situation to trust Jesus Christ to meet our need. Faith breaks through. You can, you can fill in the blank just now. What's your hopeless situation? What's your, what are you struggling with right now? What seems like there's no solution to this thing? 
we can, we can all identify something that's just not going right. What are you facing now where it seems there's no way out? Jesus wants to meet you there. And why did Jesus tell them not to tell anybody? It just sort of puzzle you a little bit, don't you think? I mean, this ought to be told around a bit. Well, for one reason, maybe he didn't want to be called to every funeral for the next <laughs> 10 years, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, he wanted that mom and dad who were present there. He wanted Peter and James and John. And he wanted you and me to see the son of God at work to see God, the Son, do what he loves to do. To see the Savior of the world saving lives physically and spiritually. He wanted us to see that. That's why it's recorded in the scriptures, right? We're allowed to be there in the room with them. This is God in the flesh. This is God in the flesh. He's the one who can do all things. Ah, Lord God, you've made the heavens and the earth by your mighty power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. This is the one. He's the one. He's the one who tamed the sea and who tamed the wild man. He's the one who's victorious over sin and over death. He is God the Son. He's Lord over the earth. He's Lord over the universe. He's the one who sits most high in the heavens right now. And he's the one we follow and he's the one we trust. Is he? He's the one and we've seen him here. Jesus is the object of our faith. And because faith is this conviction born out of great need or tons of needs that breaks through pride and social pressures and religious pressures and even hopeless situations, we keep coming back to Jesus because Jesus is the one who can meet our need. He is absolutely faithful in every way. I want to tell you a story. Um, this is, you've maybe heard it before. It's about a guy called Jan Paderus Paderuski. He was a pianist. He was the Prime Minister of Poland uh, in the 1900s, and he was a composer, and he traveled a lot, and he played concerts. So he was in a town, and he was playing a concert, and there was a grand piano up on the stage, and people were just coming in, and he was off to the wings. And a mother had brought her son, and they were sitting in the front row, and while the mother was talking to a friend, the boy got up and went on stage and sat down at the grand piano. And a lot of people had gathered. So he sat down to the piano. His mother was teaching him how to play, but he only knew one song, and it was chops Chopsticks. So he's there, and he starts on the piano, the grand piano. And some of the people are getting a little... I didn't come here to pay money to hear a kid play chopsticks, you know, or whatever it is. So anyway, Paderewski runs out from the side of the stage, and he reaches around the boy. Here's the kid. And he starts improvising up and down the keyboard, and he whispers into this boy's ear, don't quit. Don't stop. Together, you and I will make beautiful music. And that's like Jesus to us, is it? It is. Don't stop. He's absolutely faithful. Keep on trusting him because exactly who he is. He's the way maker and all those other things that we were singing about. And he is with you. So, Lord Jesus, uh, God in the flesh, we see you ministering beautifully to these people. And they, your love just poured out in grace and mercy. And 
you just are this perfect representation of God, the exact uh, replica of God to us, that you are gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Oh, Lord, how we want to be like this as well. We want to keep on trusting you through the hard times and the good times and keep on lifting up your name, worshiping you, 